I'm honored to be able to speak at the discussion on freedom of conscience and religion in pandemic times. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Istvan Shabjanic. I'm an assistant professor at PASMAI in the International Public Law Department and the Administrative Law Department. I would like to uh, address briefly the international background of the right uh, to freedom of religion and belief with a special focus on the regional mechanisms in Africa and uh, present particularly the case of South Africa, which we all know that has a, a special variant of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Uh, um, um, and uh, for reasons of time efficiency, I will read my discussion, if you allow me. Uh, in international law, the UN Charter, for practical reasons, only mention, mentions uh, religion in the context of prohibiting discrimination. The right to freedom of religion and belief is guaranteed by Article 18 of the Universal Declaration on, of Human Rights, uh, signed in 1948, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, signed in 1966, and by the UN Declaration uh, on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and uh, of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief, signed in 1981. Um, the years uh, are, are uh, crucial, uh, as, as we see in the following. Uh, based on historical experiences, especially of the 20th century, specificity is crucial for the effectiveness of protecting the right to freedom of religion and belief in domestic law. International law, for the sake of endorsing the general concepts of religious equality, bypassed the opportunity to create a detailed set of rules and regulations, which gave, gave way for more effective regional cooperations. In the regional level of international law, Contrary to the vagueness of the aforementioned international documents, um, we find a bit more specific uh, 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 set of rules, but with uneven effectiveness, uh, as we will see in the following. The European Convention on Human Rights, signed two years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the American Convention on Human Rights, signed in 1969, three years after the International Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights, uh, they both provide a list of legitimate reasons for limiting the right to, uh, to freedom of religion and belief by domestic law. Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 12 of the American Convention on Human Rights recognize the protection of public safety, order and health, morals and the right of others to freedom of religion and belief as a legitimate reason for limitation. Religious freedoms uh, of peoples in Africa, however, came second in line after the sovereignty and territory integrity of countries in the post-colonial era of Africa. Article 8 of the African Charter on Human, Human and People's Rights, shortly called the Banjo Charter from 1981, uh, so the same year as the UN Declaration, which I mentioned before, um, recognizes the freedom of conscience profession and free practice of religion, but with a slight difference regarding the limitation uh, of, uh, of the freedom in domestic law. The main problem with Article 8 of the Banjo Charter is the inclusion of the clawback clause to law and order, which basically allows member states to effectively limit the right to freedom of religion to the maximum extent by simply referring back to the adequate domestic law. In other words, the member states in Africa, without any political or legal consequences from, international, uh, from the international level, uh, can enact laws that could potentially violate the right to freedom of religion or belief, uh, and with it practically slowly but surely, disable the regional human rights protection system of Africa. There are some inspiring and insightful cases uh, of the African Court on Human and People's Rights, which uh, was uh, created by the Banjo Charter. Uh, though it's obviously not appearing in numbers with its European counterpart, and not just because the European Court has several more decades in advance. Unlike the rulings of the African Commission uh, on Human uh, and People's Rights that was also established, uh, by the Venger Charter, uh, which are merely recommendations, the court's decisions have binding effects. Unfortunately, the court's mandatory jurisdiction is shrinking since uh, in 2020, Tanzania, Benin and Cote d'Ivoire 
have revoked uh, the right of individuals and NGOs to sue them before the court. Consequently, out of 54 member states of the African Union, the court has binding jurisdiction only over five countries with individuals and NGOs as applicants. So we have a regional human rights regime that in comparison with the European and American system gives much more space for the member states uh, own agendas, own political agendas. Uh, so let's see how it works in practice. Uh, for example, in South Africa, uh, with its diverse population, rich re legal and cultural traditions, uh, clo close ties to European legal reasoning, uh, and the third biggest economy in Africa, um, South Africa is a great example to expose the struggle of implementing mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations. So currently in South Africa, there is a strong political debate on the effectiveness and costs of the government COVID-19 vaccine rollout plan. One of the debated questions is whether receiving the vaccine can be legally mandated by the government. It is still debated whether the government has the ability to propose adequate legislation or initiate other governmental measures in order to enforce COVID-19 vaccinations. Both sides of the argument for and against mandatory vaccination cite legal and traditional cultural concepts. On one hand, some argue that without adequate legislation for mandatory immunization, the country could be placed at serious risk. South Africa left the political system of the apartheid almost three decades ago, yet the majority of the population is still quite suspicious of any actions of the national government. According to one suggestion between the legally mandated mass vaccination and the voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, re uh, registration, a third way in the middle could be if parliament, through adequate amendments of employment uh, regulations, enabled employers to introduce mandatory vaccine policies in the workplace. Although this might face some rejection from employers as well, the rejection of mandatory vaccinations by employees in the workplace could constitute constructive dismissal as a result, which raises many questions that are not necessarily uh, relevant for reaching the COVID-19 herd immunization in South Africa. Like for instance, the difference between uh, WFHs and WFAs, working from home and working from anywhere uh, and working in the office, or legally mandated protection of certain employees for reasons of age, maternity and disabilities, etc. Section uh, 12 of the Constitution of South Africa protects the right to freedom and security of a person. Section 12.2 provides that every person has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right to make decisions concerning reproduction, to security in and control over their body, and not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without, uh, without their informed consent. No person shall be, shall be denied the protection that Section 12 offers. Consequently, every person has the right to make decisions on health and medical interventions and treatment, which undoubtedly includes the acceptance or rejection of, of the COVID-19 vaccine. Contrary to the seemingly clear constitutional provisions, the National Health Act preserves the possibility of treatment without consent. People in South Africa can register for the Pfizer, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Most, health, most uh, healthcare workers have now received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in South Africa uh, since it only needed one shot and it was thus time saving. Uh, however, uh, this raises some questions from members of the Catholic Church. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith stated that when ethically irreproachable uh, COVID-19 vaccines are not available, it is morally acceptable to receive COVID-19 vaccines that have used cell lines uh, from aborted fetuses and, uh, in their research and production process. Uh, and that if one can choose among equally safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines, the vaccine with the least connection to abortion derived uh, uh, cell, uh, cell lines uh, should be chosen. Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine is said to have used cell lines uh, from aborted fetuses. <clears throat> South Africa has a population of 59 million, out of which uh, 3.8 million people are a member uh, of the Catholic Church, so approximately 6%. Uh, the majority of them is Black African, mainly Zulu, Xhosa, and Sotho. Consequently, the political impact of an objection of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, based on religious belief would not make any difference. 
in South Africa, the culture of Ubuntu, however, means that an individual should act in a manner which benefits the greater community. When balancing uh, the interests of the community recognized in mass vaccination and the interest of the individual protected by the Constitution, we see Ubuntu on both sides. While the constitutionally protected rights of the individual seem untouchable by the arguments for mandatory mass vaccination, there are some cases when the courts ruled in favor of the community, uh, partly because they cited Ubuntu uh, in their ruling. In the case of uh, Minister of Safety and Security and Van der Heven uh, v. Gaka from 2002, the respondent had a bullet in his leg that could have been used as an evidence in a bank robbery, but he refused the surgery for the bullet to be removed from his leg. Uh, no effect to the repeated uh, requests uh, from authorities. Uh, in this case, the court relied on the public interest of safety and security and applied the balancing, right, uh, balancing act of rights to conclude that the respondent was forced to undergo surgery, even though he never consented to surgery in the first place. Correspondingly, in the case of Minister of Health uh, or, uh, of the province of the Western Cape, the Goyat and others from 2009, the court compelled uh, uh, the surviving respondents to receive treatment for tuberculosis against their will. These decisions show that in some instances, uh, the public interest outweighs the right to bodily and psychological integrity of individuals, which is protected by the constitution. Africa has a regional human rights regime with debatable effectiveness. The continent is rich with resources and has the highest birth rate, yet poverty generates unstable governments uh, uh, with a handful of remarkable exceptions. Uh, this political climate encourages a different kind of violation of international law, na namely ignoring member states' obligations defined in the international health regulations. With incompetent administration, the lack of funds or political will, even getting accurate numbers of the COVID-19 infected or deceased uh, can be challenging. Thus, unfortunately, in Africa, holding back the vaccine or distributing it in a corrupt, corrupt fashion is more likely to happen than enforcing mandatory vaccination on the general population. Uh, for, um, so this was my uh, uh, discussion and um, I prepared uh, a question for Professor Strang if, if uh, I'm allowed. Uh, and my question uh, would be, uh, from your presentation, it seems clear that uh, the changes in society in the last century, like uh, um, atheism growing in numbers, uh, paved the way for, for anti-clerical legislation and court decisions that you have mentioned. Uh, demography, however, foreshadows a change once again with Latinos uh, uh, giving the majority of more and more states. Do you see a political progress of the? Do you see the political progress of the last decades carved in stone, uh, or there is a place for a new political legal narrative for church responsibilities, like the ones you mentioned uh, uh, in your presentation? And 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 uh, just one addition, uh, if if uh, if I still have the floor, um, I have to confess that beside uh, Pazmai, I work for the state-owned IT company. Uh, that has a crucial part in developing the data background uh, necessary for the infamous card that Professor Ching mentioned. Uh, and to be specific, there are two types uh, of card, one without an expiration date. Those are really the vaccination cards. And the other type has an expiration date. Uh, this is for those who caught uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, uh, recovered. So basically the expiration date is usually uh, six months from, from recovery. Um, and uh, I'm really not sure uh, which type will Professor Ching get because he got one shot and recovered from, from uh, COVID-19 successfully. So I'm not sure. Thank you for your, uh, for your time and attention.